Aviation Week and Space Technology. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Good morning, station. This is Mark Carreau with Aviation Week and Space Technology. How do you hear me? Hi, Mark. Uh, welcome aboard the International Space Station. Thank you. Um, I've got some questions. I know you're both busy, so I appreciate the opportunity. I wonder if the two of you could discuss what the key challenges are for this third spacewalk as it's currently planned. It seems like there's lots of cable and lots of space station real estate to deal with. That's right, Mark. Uh, we're continuing the cable theme that we had from the first two EVAs, and uh, this one we're going to lay down over 400 feet of cable. We're going to send two cables out to the left side of the station, or port side, and two to the right side, or starboard side. And uh, these cables are going to attach to some antennas that are going to be used for the future American vehicles that are going to be docking, bringing crew to the space station starting in a few years. So we need to put these antennas and the cables there for them and also some reflectors so their onboard navigation systems that use lasers can see the reflectors. And uh, that way the spaceship will know where the station is and what orientation it's in and we'll be able to dock properly. So uh, there's a lot of moving from one end to the other of the station and a lot of equipment and hardware that we're going to be bringing out there. And Terry, I'd like to ask you if, uh, if you and the experts on the ground are any closer to identifying the source of the water in your spacesuit helmet after the second spacewalk and how concerned you might be about embarking on a third spacewalk in the same spacesuit. Well, you know, uh, to be honest, I've been busy getting ready for the third uh, spacewalk, and I know a lot of specialists. I've gotten some emails and talked to folks on the ground. They're very busy analyzing the data. Uh, this is something that we've seen before, and I mentioned it yesterday when I noticed some water. I said it might be the same issue. It's happened a few times. Um, so it's something that it, it's possible that it's something that we've seen before, but that's still to be determined. And I'm sure that NASA is looking very intently at it, and they're going to have a good answer for us here shortly. Um, as far as being concerned, I'm actually pretty happy with this spacesuit. It's gotten me out the door and back in safely twice, so I kind of like it. And, and hopefully it's good, and I can keep on going out in the same one. Well, it, it sounds like uh, if, if they can find a satisfactory answer, um, you're, you're prime. You're ready to go on this one. That's right. Yeah, Butch and I will absolutely be ready to go, and um, it's just a question. The ground's going to make the decision for us uh, after looking at the data, and, and uh, I'm, I'm completely confident I'm not going outside unless we're sure that it's a good, shoot, good suit. Okay, and I'd like to ask the both of you, um, these, this series of three spacewalks to reconfigure the station for these commercial uh, docking ports seems, uh, you know, bigger than just the, just the work of putting the hardware in place, this is really sort of giving uh, the U.S. space program a new direction. And uh, I just wonder what the two of you think about the significance of this activity that you've undertaken. Oh, it, it's absolutely huge significance. It is, it is changing our capabilities of the International Space Station. We're preparing for the future. As we prepare for, as Terry said, for these, these U.S. vehicles to dock to the station, right now we've got the old shuttle docking adapters, uh, and they're kind of big. Those kind of docking adapters are big and heavy, and, and these smaller vehicles, there's no reason to put that kind of weight on them. So the docking adapters are different. And so we put those docking adapters on there. Like we said, they have to have power, and getting that power to them is, is our job, or working those cables to get it to it. And this this is a huge effort. Yeah, we've spent some, you know, six and a half hours on two spacewalks outside, but it has been literally years of planning. Engineers, training teams, assessment teams, uh, operational teams uh, across our nation doing much in preparation for this. So this is, a, this is a huge endeavor. You're absolutely right in that assessment. I wonder if, uh, if the two of you could give us a little insight in the sort of physical demands, uh, even the mental demands of doing this kind of work. Um, I. I listened yesterday to the spacewalks, and it seemed like there was an awful lot of coordination between the two of you, probably as much uh, just looking at one another as actually talking, uh, and also the sort of support that you got from uh, Samantha and also on the ground from Joe Acaba and kind of cueing you here and there to, uh, to what was coming next. And I just wonder how important that sort of teamwork is to accomplishing these goals. 
Yeah, that teamwork is absolutely vital. These these goals don't get accomplished. These objectives do not happen without the work of everybody coming together. And, you know, in Joe uh, talking to us, he's just the voice of many people in the background that are talking to him, and he's the conduit of, of communication to us back and forth. So there's many, many uh, people on the ground that are assessing, you know, real-time, making real-time changes to what's taking place. And uh, like I said, he's a, he's the, one of the prime ones. And Samantha, like you said, uh, Terry and Samantha worked together to lube the, the arm yesterday and it would not have happened uh, they got all the get-aheads done and it would not have happened in our time allotted had not Samantha been exactly ready to start and do her part every single time so her part was vital as well and as far as the physical aspects I can tell you there's there's not many things that, that I think that are more mentally and physically challenging uh, simultaneously as, as doing a spacewalk like this with all the intricate details and the various things and and there's no way that at least in my brain that I can mentally put it all together and make it happen alone. Uh, that's why we need Joe and those ground teams feeding us information. Uh, sometimes where a handrail is located, something as simple as that. Uh, and it's like you said, it's absolutely crucial to the success of any endeavor like this. And what about the uh, the physicality of it? Um, I, I guess I'm really kind of wondering if, if you know, are, you, are your hands uh, in need of more rest or uh, your arms and all that, or, or can you work in the spacesuits and do all the stuff that's planned for the third spacewalk without being, um, you know, cramped or, or too sore at the end? Yeah, you are absolutely sore and uh, tired after a spacewalk. The good news is it seems like uh, your body heals a little bit quicker in space than it does on Earth. But uh, they give us a few days off, which are really important, like you said, to just to heal your forearms and your, and your, your hand muscles. Um, but you are tired. I've done a few marathons on Earth and half marathons, and the spacewalk is, is, is definitely takes a lot of energy out of you. We were talking to the doctors yesterday just about our heart rates, and it's amazing the heart rate level and the amount of physical work you do for uh, the six and a half hours we were outside, plus a couple hours beforehand in the suit and about an hour afterwards in the suit. So it's a lot of uh, work. You're absolutely right about the physical aspect of a spacewalk. Okay. Let me add one thing. The uh, one thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is that you know when you're out on, in the in the vacuum of space, uh, it's like literally uh, almost 300 degrees, and and the place you can feel that is right in, in our fingertips when we're on the you know on the on the, the sun side of the orbit, and that heat. Uh, you don't feel 300 degrees at your fingertips, but you feel warm. That heat combined with the fatigue inside those gloves really does wear on those fingertips for a while. When, you know, when you come back in, your fingertips are all pink and white and, and discolored and, and very, very tender. And after the first spacewalk, even your, your fingernails feel like they get peeled back a little bit. And after the first spacewalk, it took about three days before they felt really normal. And uh, I told Terry, I said, I bet you after the second one we'll feel better. And, then, and it, that is indeed the case. This morning I feel much better than I did the morning after the first one. So just just, anyway, just a little piece of information. No, that's very interesting. It, it seems very physical. Um, my last question uh, for you, uh, Butch, is I know your mission is uh, nearing an end in a couple of weeks. I just uh, wonder how you might characterize your time aboard the space station as a sort of life experience. I think one the, the first adjective that comes to mind is thrilling. Uh, the second group of words that come to, to mind is uh, a great deal of work. This is a busy place, and it needs to be. I mean, you come up here, you need to be ready to work, and there's a great deal that we're trying to accomplish. And so that means pretty much sun up to sun down as it would be on Earth, anyway, though we get 16 of them here, that it's continual work almost all day, every day. And it, like I said, it needs to be that way because there's so much that we're trying to accomplish. So you got to come up here with a, an eager, energetic attitude and uh, keep the fire burning because uh, it's, it's pretty busy, like I said, and it should be. Okay, well, let me thank both of you and wish you both uh, the best of luck as you uh, pursue the rest of your uh, cable hookups. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you, Mark. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Aviation Week and space technology portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from Way TV. This is Way TV. How do you hear me? We read you loud and clear. Welcome on board, Way TV. We read you loud and clear. Flight Engineer Terry Verts and ISS Commander Butch Wilmar joining me right now. Um, 
Butch and Terry, I'm here in Huntsville, uh, home of the, the Marshall Space Flight Center. And they're probably at the POIC. They're probably a little angry right now that I'm taking some of your time away from science. But I wanted to ask you, I talk to them all the time about how they work with you. So I wanted to ask you, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, how often are you guys working with the people here in Huntsville? Yeah, uh, goodness. On, on uh, Well, first of all, uh, home of the Marshall Space Flight Center and home of a lot of snow, I understand. Um, we are uh, working with them every day, and we are just, uh, on most days, on the last few days it's been spacewalks, but on most days we're dealing with them. There's lots of different experiments. Every day it's a different type of experiment, a different variety, and so uh, one of the best parts of our time here is a chance to do science. It's the mission that we're here for, and it's a lot of fun doing such a varied and different amount of science that we do. Thanks, Terry. Uh, you mentioned the spacewalk that you guys just did. I, I know uh, the POIC crew got a little bit of a break yesterday while you guys were out for about six and a half hours. Um, you guys are in the airlock right now. I know both of you are experienced spacewalkers, but the question that I have is when that airlock opens and you're suited up, what is going through your mind? Well, I'll say for me, this was my first, and yesterday was my second spacewalk. Uh, what's going through my mind is uh, what do I do next? Where's my tether going to go? What handrail do I go to? And, uh, you know, what, what are the next steps that we're going to do? So I'm, I'm pretty much just focused on the task. Excuse me, some of our spacewalking equipment just floated by. <laughs> but uh, you have to be for every minute. It's six and a half hours out the door, but inside it's a couple extra hours beforehand, an hour afterwards. And so it's literally, it's like 12 hours of 100% concentration on every, every second of what you're doing. Yeah, I'll say also that uh, that the kind of the motto that Terry and I talk about before we go out and remind each other is that there's nothing more important than what you're doing right now. If you've done something great, put it behind you. You got you got more work to do. If you've done something bad, put it behind you. You got more work to do. You can't think about what's coming in the future because you're in the vacuum of space and you're attached to the to the station by a little bitty, you know, kind of a little metal tether and uh, anything could go awry at any moment. So uh, you really got to be focused on your task. Make sure your local tethers are there. You're, you're, you're attaching yourself to the station and keep your mind turning. You know, when we fly airplanes, both of us are pilots. So, well, he's a pilot and I'm a naval aviator, but uh, uh, you always sort of think about staying in front of the airplane. You never want to get it where you're hanging on to the tail of the airplane and we think the thing, thing, same thing about spacewalking is that if, if, if you feel like you're getting behind, you miss and you realize that you didn't put down a local tether when you should, slow down because it's vital I and mean, it's a very dangerous environment as you know and it's vital that we do things and we do it right and so safety is paramount and that's, that's kind of what we just, like I said, try to keep reminding ourselves of. Well, I've been seeing on, on Twitter you guys have tweeted out spacewalk selfies and stuff like that so while Remaining focused on the job is something that you're, you're always doing. Uh, it looks like you, you take a moment every now and then to just appreciate, you know, I'm doing something that very few people have ever done before. Is, is that right? Well, that's right. You know, I'm a photographer. I love taking pictures. Um, but I was really shocked on both the first and second spacewalk that we did, how little time there was to take pictures. On the first spacewalk, there was there was basically no time I had to grab the camera, snap a few pictures real quick for maybe a minute or less and put it away. And I think I did that two or three times, almost no time at all. And even on the second spacewalk, when I had some time uh, it, where I was just standing still, I thought I'd have a few minutes to take pictures, but it almost didn't exist because there's so much work that you need to do. And you just don't want to waste any time. You just want to get the work done. So we try and take them when we can, and hopefully we got a few good ones. But uh, it was surprising to me because I love taking pictures, and I thought I'd make some time. But it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to grab a few minutes uh, when you're doing a spacewalk. Um, Bush, this question might be more for you. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, the 3D printer. I know that's, that's a project they got going on at Marshall right now. And uh, they told me that you've kind of adopted that. You installed it, pulled off the first pieces and all that. Um, so I just want to ask, what, what's the interest in that? Why, why did you kind of take ownership of that? 
Well, you know, you don't, you don't like just go out and say that's mine. I'll take that. Fortunately, I was very fortunate that uh, it would just kind of fell in my lap. I was here at the time, kind of alone. I was between missions, and it was time to install it. So uh, I, I sort of got to install it, and from there, I just kind of kept getting scheduled to work with it. And it was, it's very intriguing. I mean, you think about the concept of of needing a part for the space station you don't have on board, and being a, being able literally to print it out in a printer and then go install it. Oh, I need this special tool. I don't have that tool on board. Okay, well, let's print out that special tool and. And, uh, and make it work. And we actually printed out a small uh, wrench as well. So, I mean, it's it's just fascinating technology. The possibilities are absolutely endless. We're in the baby steps right now of learning how to do this process. We're just using plastics right now uh, in the zero-G environment. But the, the, the prospects are, like I said, are just out of this world, literally, about uh, where this could take us. Um, I'd like to follow up on that. Where do you guys see this technology going? Um, and what do you see its value being for astronauts? You know, you guys are about a few hours away from a resupply, but when we start going farther and farther and farther, um, wh what do you see the worth of that technology once it starts maturing? Well, yeah, it's absolutely um, valuable for something like that. If you could print out tools or parts, um, that could really save on the amount of mass that you have to launch into space. And it could also give you some flexibility if something broke that you didn't anticipate breaking, you could print it out and use that part. So uh, in the future, th this could be really, really valuable. Right now, there are certain types of plastics that they're using. Uh, but if they, you know, maybe eventually we'll be able to do something like metal or with that type of hardness. So yeah, the for future space exploration, there's no resupply missions on Mars. So this could be huge. Yeah, I'm excited to see where they're going to take it. Um, but. We're about out of time now, so I just wanted to ask, um, Terry, I know you're about halfway through your, ex your mission. Uh, Butch, you're, you're coming to the end, so I wanted to ask both of you, what, if you could pick one moment that you're going to look back on your time in space right now, what, what would that be? You know, I'll, I'll say, it's hard to say that because there's been so many moments continually, but I saw a sunrise yesterday that, like, I've never seen a sunrise before. In the visor, you just have this big panorama, and when you look out of the station windows, it's incredible, but there's modules and there's things in the way. But sitting there on the foot restraint, it was just, you know, my body sticking out, and watching the sunrise was just incredible. Um, it's like you're looking down on creation, and... Uh, and also, Butch and I both noticed that we saw shades of colors that I'd never seen before, especially blue. So I, that's definitely going to stick in my mind forever. John. And I think for me, without question, it's it's not the personal experience so much for me as it is, you know, we're, we're, we're giving, loving, caring beings. That's, that's what we are. And to be able to share this experience has been what I'll remember the most. You know, the excitement to my wife and my daughters and my brother and my mom and dad and, and many friends and family by some pictures and some conversations that we have. Uh, those are the things that I'll remember the most without question. Certainly I'll take the sights and the sounds and the pictures all together. You can't have that without that. But the, the sharing and, and the, with the people that you love and care about is very, very special and very, very memorable. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure that's quite an experience. So we're, we're about out of time. I got one last question for you, Butch. So we're here in Alabama in the Tennessee Valley. I know you're from Tennessee. Do um, you have anything you'd like to say to your southern neighbors uh, here in the Rocket City? You know, we love Alabama, except in football season, us Tennesseans. And, and we know that Alabamans don't live in God's country like us Tennesseans do, but you're very close, very close cousins, and we love y'all just the same. So absolutely, we love Alabama. All right, thanks a lot. Butch and Terry, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Butch, I hope you're safe return home in the next couple of weeks. Um, thanks a lot. Good luck with the rest of your trip. All right, thank you. And uh, thank you to Alabama and all of uh, your Wade TV listeners. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, Aviation Week and Space Technology and WAAY-TV. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.